versucht zu sehen, wie das Election zu seinem 80. Geburtstag erfunden hat, wobei die Lecture eine spezielle Ausrichtung hat. Wir haben in Anbetracht der Tatsache, dass der Bajakovic sehr viel in Frankreich tätig war in Zeiten seines Berufs, insbesondere zur EZB-Vertreter, zweimal ausführlich und lang. Und, äh, und weil er ein ganzes Leben lang unter euch frankophil war, uns entschlossen, jeweils französische Wissenschaftler oder eine Wissenschaftlerin erstmals heute einzuladen zu dieser jankovic lecture Das hat unter anderem auch für uns als Institut den Vorzug, dass wir einen Blick in Frankreich, nach Frankreich werfen können, zu dem wir sonst relativ wenig in Wissenschaftsbücher hinsichtlich verbunden sind. Wir wissen nicht sehr viel über die französische Forschung und Wissenschaftslandschaft. Wir freuen uns jedes Mal darüber zu hören und auch Kontakt mit nach Frankreich aufbauen zu können. Das ist der Hintergrund auch für die heutige Lecture, aber dazu kommt, kommen nachher noch einführende Worte von unserer wissenschaftlichen Beiträge, Frau Professor Stachowitsch. Ich möchte an dieser Stelle eigentlich nur mehr einen Dank an das Institut für Höhere Studien, das wir hier ist, aussprechen, dass wir uns den Raum zur Verfügung stellen. Wir haben ein bisschen Raumprobleme gehabt, weil unser Förderer von früher, der uns auch immer den Raum zur Verfügung gestellt hat, jetzt wird sich so stark sparen muss, das ist eine Bank. Äh, dass sie sich das nicht mehr leisten können, um uns einzuladen. Äh, ist schade, aber so weg ist es dahin, die Banken, die Großen. Äh, wir haben also Rücksicht genommen darauf und sind jetzt hier zu Gast. Und finanziell ist das Institut, das ist Finanzmarktwert, das kann nicht gleich. Äh, da vielleicht jetzt einerseits mit diesem Bank schon übergehen zum nächsten Punkt. Wir haben uns vorgenommen, Ihnen heute auch einen kleinen Film zu zeigen, kurz, nicht sehr lang. Anlass des 40. Geburtstags des Instituts, des Österreichischen Instituts für internationale Politik. Wir sind ziemlich stolz darauf, dass das schon 40 Jahre lebt und nicht eingegangen ist. Die Bemühungen, auch uns zu beseitigen, waren doch beträchtlich. Äh, bis jetzt schaffen wir es. Jedes Jahr zwar irgendwie neu, aber doch. Und jetzt sind wir 40 Jahre alt geworden, dafür haben wir einen kleinen Film gemacht und wollen wir Ihnen zeigen, bevor Frau Professor Stavkovic unser heutiger Redner im Vorstellung und begrüßt. <lacht>
Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. As a scientific director of the OIIT, I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's lecture, The Future of Transatlantic Relations Beyond President Trump. Looking beyond that, this is what we're going to do tonight. Um, as already mentioned, and you've seen the, our little movie, uh, we're celebrating 40 years of OIIP tonight, and the whole year through. So for four decades, we've been analyzing, researching, working at the intersections of academic research, policy consultancy, and public engagement. And so this is a special year for us, one in which we not only want to celebrate, but we also want to raise the really big issues of international politics. And we want to do it with the most exciting, most interesting scholars and experts that are available around the globe. And our speaker tonight is one such scholar. And the topic that we're going to address, transatlantic relations, is for sure one of those very crucial issues. And an issue that is challenging because of the current US administration, also because of Brexit. So lots of things going on there that we watch and often don't get to properly analyze and understand. Um, we have dedicated a lot of space in our anniversary to this issue. We've had a talk earlier this year with Dan Hamilton of the Johns Hopkins University talking about similar issues. But we believe that the European perspectives are also worthwhile looking at in this context, uh, and particularly the French perspective. Not only because we don't do it enough, as hinted at uh, by our president, but also because the French perspective will matter a great deal in reshaping those very same um, transatlantic relations. And we couldn't have a more experienced and knowledgeable speaker on this subject tonight who knows French policy and academic debates extremely well. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Alexandra de Hopschäfer. She is a senior transatlantic fellow and the director of the German Marshall Fund of the United States Paris office. There she leads the transatlantic security program, which brings together policymakers, researchers, industry representatives to discuss the future of these transatlantic relations. She's also an associate professor at the Sciences Po Paris. She's teaching international politics and transatlantic relations. She's the co-director of the Paris-based journal Politique Américaine. And her expertise is frequently drawn on by government agencies, including the um, State Department uh, of France, but also companies and other stakeholders in the process. Her field of expertise includes US foreign policy, French politics, French-US relations, French-German relations, uh, and international security more broadly. All of which I think will to some extent feature or at least inform tonight's talk, in which Professor de Hopschäfer will remind us to not only focus on the attention-grabbing, very visible politics of the Trump administration, but really take a more long-term perspective onto US global leadership and how it will evolve in the future. Um, and I'm also personally glad that this is finally the first female speaker we have in this particular lecture series. It is very often said that it's also difficult to find competent women in this particular field. Well, we have no problem finding you, <laughs> and we're glad that you're here. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, as you know, I am uh, uh, French. I'm also Dutch. I have a very Dutch name, but I'm very French. You will notice by my accent from the French tradition protocol is to do the first words in French. Alors, bonsoir tout le monde. Merci beaucoup de votre chaleureux accueil. Et uh, je suis très, très heureuse d'être parmi vous uh, ce soir. It's a real pleasure to, to be with you uh, this evening. I was really surprised by the invitation uh, because usually we say that French people speak too much. Um, <laughs> and uh, this time I got uh, an invitation coming from your, uh, your, your impressive uh, institute uh, saying that there, there was really some interest and eagerness uh, to have uh, a French perspective on 
geopolitical uh, uh, issues. Um, I'm the head of the, the German Marshall Fund of the United States in, in Paris. You might know or might have even worked uh, with this uh, think tank. Um, we are very uh, unique in the think tank uh, landscape because our headquarters is in Washington and we have uh, six offices in Europe, Paris, Berlin, Brussels, Warsaw, Bucharest, Belgrade, two smaller representations in Stockholm and Turin in Italy, and outside of the EU, it's always important to underline that, especially in France, uh, Ankara uh, in, uh, in Turkey, which allows us really to have, um, I would say, a quite unique understanding uh, of the uh, economic, social, political, uh, strategic uh, debates um, going on in all of these countries, which uh, makes my work really fascinating, challenging, uh, of course, but everything uh, I do in Paris is not just only French and French and American, obviously, but really Euro-American. And you were saying in your uh, introduction that there was a need to better understand uh, French perspectives or other perspectives here in, here in Vienna. And that really is at the core of what I believe as well, is that we really, especially in today's uh, international context, need to better <coughs> understand each other. Uh, to better understand what's going on in the United States. I must say that's the most challenging part uh, of my job uh, because of the uncertainty and the uh, unpredictability of what's going on there. Um, and uh, to also you know, challenge uh, the French uh, government, the French uh, corporate, the French academics, by bringing to Paris European perspectives and American perspectives so that the French also have a broader understanding of the debates going on in their neighboring, uh, in their neighboring uh, countries and, uh, and partners. And I must say that's something that we are often tempted not to do enough, which uh, might lead sometimes to uh, a few uh, misunderstandings. I'm thinking of, for example, the very French concept of uh, autonomie stratégique, strategic autonomy. Uh, that is particularly, I must say, uh, uh, pertinent uh, in the transatlantic context today. It's amazing to see how this, con this concept of European strategic autonomy pops up when we are in a conflicting situation with uh, Washington. Uh, but these are the types of concepts that uh, actually, uh, the definition of it is maybe not shared in the same way in Berlin, in Warsaw, or here in, in Vienna, and that uh, we as French need to better understand and take into consideration. So that's basically uh, what I do on a daily basis, and we do that uh, through publications, through seminars, through conferences like these, but also by um, uh, encouraging young talents, young leaders to actually travel uh, through our offices network in Europe, but also in the United States, because we believe that these future leaders in the private public sector will have an important role to play in this transatlantic uh, relationship. Uh, so thank you again for your, your warm, warm welcome and I really uh, look forward to the discussion uh, after my, uh, my presentation. Um, so what I wanted to do is to uh, structure, so you can see there's, there are actually three flags, uh, if you have noticed. Uh, the American, European, and the little Chinese, <laughs> which is done on purpose uh, because um, uh, today we cannot think or talk about transatlantic relationship obviously without taking into consideration uh, the broader international context and more specifically uh, the Chinese uh, uh, power. At least that's something that is really present in the Washington uh, perspective. So I wanted to address three, that's the structure, uh, we learned that at Sciences Po, you know, to be very structured in our presentation. The first one is really to look at the state, the current state of transatlantic relationship, to see how um, Trump or Trumpism, uh, or the ingredients of Trumpism were actually already present uh, in US politics. And to look as well as at the broader, I would say, international context and how this is affecting U.S. global leadership and our relationship with the United States. Uh, the second is to look more at us Europeans and what kind of partner do we want to be. 
uh, for the United States. What role can we play, uh, especially in this uh, competition between the United States and China? And then look forward uh, the future transatlantic relationship, trying to go beyond uh, uh, Trump. What will remain uh, from from Trump? Uh, and what are the uh, key elements, items that we should be paying uh, attention to? Uh, so the first one is the transatlantic uh, relationship. I'm struck uh, to to hear in many of the conversations uh, we organize at GMF, be it in Paris, in Berlin, or even in, in Washington, here Europeans, you know, asking the same question: Are we witnessing the end of transatlantic relations? Uh, this was particularly uh, strong uh, during the uh, recent 75th anniversary of D-Day, which took place on the beaches uh, of, uh, of Normandy. Um, this sort of um, you know, image of a transatlantic relationship that is today fractured uh, with the U.S. that uh, you know, is not willing to play anymore the role it has been playing since the end of the Second World War, the U.K. willing to exit uh, the EU, Germany being in a sort of uh, political uh, uh, weakness uh, uh, period, and France in the middle uh, trying to act uh, as, uh, as, a, as a leader, at least on the diplomatic scene and many other uh, uh, issues. Um, but I don't think we're witnessing at all the end of the transatlantic relationship. I've uh, been working in the transatlantic relationship now for uh, almost 15 years and I can tell you how intense uh, the, the cooperation still is on many important issues. I think what we are seeing is a more gradual, um, deeper transformation or what I would call recalibrage in France, a recalibrating uh, of the transatlantic relationship uh, due to two trends. Uh, first. Uh, the changes in U.S. global leadership and how the United States perceives itself in the current international context, and because also of this, the, the, the more broader, uh, um, I would say, global uh, dynamics. So first, uh, U.S. global leadership, that's a very big issue that we are all looking at. Um, are the U.S. still willing to lead? Do we still need U.S. leadership? Uh, if the United States withdraw from an agreement, what are we going to do? It's all about trying to understand what's going on and how to adjust to a different kind of American leadership. Uh, and America first, um, uh, actually, is not, is not really new. I mean, the United States has always defended its national interest. Uh, France has always defended its national interest. But America first is not... There's engagement, it's not isolationism. I think these two concepts are not accurate to actually describe what's going on. What you see rather is a disengagement from US global responsibilities, and that's different. That's very, very different. Um, and you, you heard American presidents, I think almost all American presidents saying, we don't want to be the global policeman anymore. I mean, and I can't remember American president not saying it. Uh, Obama has said it very uh, explicitly, and Trump <coughs> is saying it even more uh, explicitly. What's interesting with Trump is that he's actually not retreating from the role of global policeman. He's actually increasing it in the economic and financial field. Uh, you know, he ran uh, in 2016 his campaign saying, "I'm a tariff guy," and he shows it. I mean, sanctions. Uh, all of that, the economic tool, uh, is uh, the number one weapon he uses to try and put pressure or coerce both partners and rivals to actually uh, sign what he calls uh, better deals. What's interesting is to take a longer-term perspective. Uh, the post-Cold War period was a period of um, you all have this concept, French concept in mind, Hubert Vitrine saying, c'est l'hyperpuissance uh, American, the hyperpower, uh, this hyperconfidence in the capacity of the United States to actually achieve things in the world and to impact uh, events in the world. It was the era of democracy promotion, peace building, state building, all of these concepts. It was all about projecting the US so-called model abroad. 
Second phase post 9-11, crisis of confidence. The United States loses confidence in its capacity uh, to impact, to protect itself. And this <coughs> led to hyper-interventionism. Uh, Bush Jr. was really about, well, you know, the United States is hegemon and we're going to strike with a strong military power. And now the third phase, and we're still in that third phase, is the post-2008 financial economic crisis that after was followed by the Arab revolutions in 2011, the legacies of Afghanistan and Iraq, and all of that uh, accompanying little by little the so-called rise of, uh, of China. And so little by little, the United States moved away from the projection model to a protection or even protectionist model under uh, Trump. And what's interesting is to see that the story of US leadership or US exceptionalism mm -hmm. has always been a pendulum movement between these two, projecting US power and protecting the US uh, economic uh, social uh, model, which we can very much, of course, discuss and, and, and criticize. But Obama had already initiated this, this trend. You remember the leading from behind in Libya, where France and the UK led uh, the military intervention uh, in 2011, and his concept of nation building at home instead of the nation building abroad. And to a certain extent, what Trump is, uh, is pledging uh, is an acceleration of, I would say, the sort of progressive disengagement from the so-called post-Second World War II American uh, responsibilities. What's really striking is to look at the polls and at what the millennials are actually thinking, how they perceive U.S. leadership, U.S. power today. Let's remember that these young Americans between 18 and 24, what they have only experienced is post 9-11, it's Iraq, it's Afghanistan. And so they're saying, well, quel est le bilan? I mean, what's, how can we assess the, the, have we been successful? Have our American administration been successful? Should we continue? to project military power? Should we continue to do nation building, etc.? And what they are saying is that no, they're very actually close to what Trump is uh, advocating, which is less intervention and focusing more uh, on, I would say, the so-called daily uh, concerns of, uh, of Americans. <clears throat> so to a certain extent, the sort of um, dichotomy that Trump is building between what he called again at the UN uh, General Assembly, uh, nationalism against globalism, uh, they're not antithesis. They're actually two trends, uh, two ideologies that constantly, actually here as well in Europe, uh, are uh, being articulated uh, to, uh, together. America first also is about, and that's very striking um, for the, the United States, is about using the position of the United States as still the number one superpower, using that window of opportunity that might maybe slip uh, to the benefit of, of China to try and negotiate as quick as possible or renegotiate deals. That's also very striking when you go to Washington, this feeling of panic, total panic vis-a-vis -vis China. That's the number one obsession. State Department, Pentagon, White House, it's all about China. And it's less about trade because you know, we talk a lot about the trade war, etc. But it's less about trade, it's much more about technology. It's much more about who will lead the 21st century technologi technological hegemon? And there it is where you get the Huawei uh, battle, etc. That's an obsession at a time where in Washington there is a perception that they're maybe being already surpassed by China in that particular, uh, that particular <coughs> field. And that's why you have such a strong US uh, policy. Um, 
What's interesting, I wanted to show that poll from the Pew Research Center, which I'm sure you know all uh, very well. And uh, people polled were asked how people see the balance of power between the US and, uh, uh, and China. Uh, and that was based on uh, 25 uh, countries in the world. Uh, and what was interesting is to see the, the first question was which country, US or China, plays a more important role in the world today compared to 10 years ago? The result is really striking. China, 70%, US, 31%. So there is this perception that China is little by little surpassing the United States. The second question, China or the United States is the world's leading economic power. They're almost on an equal position. And the last one, it would be better for the world to have China or the United States as the leading power. Now that, I think, is the most interesting result. 63% the United States, 19% China. Which leads me to say that despite the whole phenomenon of Trump, and boy, we are invaded every day by really uh, crazy news and uh, quite frightening, I must say, uh, these last uh, couple of, of days. But what we can say is that despite this president sitting at the White House, uh, the United States, and we see that on all foreign policy issues, still remains a decisive power. It is decisive, decisive when it does things, but it also decides when it stops doing things. And when the United States decides to retreat partially, you know, from the climate agreement, from other important issues, it creates a space for other powers. Uh, those who study geopolitics all know that the concept of void is not uh, a concept that exists, it's not a reality. Voids in geopolitics are immediately filled by opportunistic, pragmatic players, powers, who use that to advance their own interests. And this is what you are seeing uh, with China, uh, with Russia, we can uh, discuss that. But there is still, despite all of that, a desire for US leadership. Um, and the fact that when, when the United US leadership is retreating, it's interesting to see how the, 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 the other powers or players are actually adjusting their strategies um, in, in, in reaction to how the U.S. leadership is operating. Uh, so the United States is still central, <clears throat> which leads me to the, uh, the, the second part of my first point, which is we have to take into uh, consideration the broader strategic environment and how this is changing U.S. priorities and how this is affecting us Europeans in this transatlantic relationship. As I was mentioning, uh, what really has changed these last few years, it has already started under Obama, is the strategic importance of China in American foreign policy. Uh, I mean, everything the U.S. sees or does is done through the China prism. Uh, you see that in Africa, you see that, of course, on many other uh, issues. Russia. Russia, so what's interesting is oh, Russia is not a scary uh, power, it's all about China, Russia will collapse, but Russia has become a key geopolitical player that the United States cannot circumvent. Uh, to give you two key examples, Syria today, uh, solution or uh, negotiations cannot take place without Russia at the table. Take Africa, Libya, Central Africa, these are all issues where Russia has increased its presence and is going to increasingly become an important player. So the, 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 these are dynamics <coughs> that also have been, to a certain extent, facilitated by US policy, but also facilitated by us Europeans by not having a coherent policy or any willingness or capacity to actually act or be a player, uh, especially in our uh, southern uh, neighborhood. The third factor is the weakening of Europe. I think I don't need to really go into more detail, but just a few <laughs> covers. I think it's always a very um, 
uh, telling. Uh, I mean, the EU has fundamentally changed uh, these last uh, these last years. What we used to call the big freeze, UK, France, Germany, today doesn't exist anymore. The UK is seeking a way to, to exit the EU. Germany is stuck, as this cartoon uh, shows. You have uh, people like Salvini and others who are promoting a different uh, vision of politics and a different vision of uh, uh, the relationship with, uh, with the EU uh, institutions. And so in the middle of that, uh, I would say little by default, you have friends standing out um, and trying to sometimes speak for Europe in the context of, um, of great uh, divisions. Um, and you add to that, yeah, I thought this one was quite, quite funny, and you add to that a fourth factor, which is the rejection by populations on both sides of the Atlantic. In Europe, we have that, you know, we had that in France with the gilets jaunes, uh, the yellow vest, um, a rejection of globalization or the consequences of globalization, a rejection of political elites, and citizens raising basic questions about what they, they want, they expect from their government in a constantly changing world. And so the message here is domestic politics will matter even more in um, many of the decisions that are going to be taken on the international, uh, international scene. And this, is, uh, this was after the G7 in Biarritz, uh, where you know, uh, everyone was waiting for the tweet uh, of President Trump in the plane. Uh, didn't happen yet, uh, except that our French wines are going to be taxed. We have just learned that uh, yesterday. Uh, but, but the idea is really, uh, as you said in your introduction, France today has a particular voice, a particular role in that transatlantic relationship at a time where no other European power can actually play that role. But, you know, what is the real impact of that? Uh, we can uh, uh, discuss that, uh, of course. Which leads me to the second part. Um, Europe, what kind of partner do we want to be uh, for the United States? I was just mentioning this uh, crack in what we used to call the big three, French, Germany, uh, the, the UK. France losing, if I can say, or trying to manage uh, the UK, which was a really important stra strategic ally for France and the United States. Um, and I wanted to quote uh, Ken Weinstein, which you maybe know, who is the CEO uh, of the Hudson Institute. He uh, uh, knows Europe very well. Uh, and in 2017, he wrote an article called How Trump Can Make Europe Great Again. Um, and we're saying that, uh, that Trump might be an opportunity to make, and I quote him, which is quite striking in, I would say, uh, the, <coughs> the mouth of an American, how, how, this, how Trump could make uh, the EU autonomous and strong while remaining firmly anchored in the Atlantic Alliance. Uh, and if, if I could you know, summarize the French posture uh, today vis-a-vis uh, the United States, it would be this one. It would be about how to articulate our dependencies with the United States, because we are dependent on the United States on many aspects. So when France talks of autonomie stratégique, it doesn't mean that we're suddenly going to have an army and be able to, uh, you know, to, to be completely autonomous. That's just not a reality. But how to articulate our dependencies with the U.S. and uh, are, uh, uh, I would say, part of our independence, uh, especially when it comes to values that we want to, uh, to uh, uh, defend. And I'm showing this, um, this cartoon because to me, I think sometimes Europeans overstate uh, this impression or perception uh, that the United States is withdrawing from Europe. You remember when Obama arrived in 2008, it was all about, it's a post-American Europe. Uh, Obama is a Pacific uh, president, he's going to focus on Asia, the pivot to Asia, and he's going to abandon us. We have a bit the same perception with Trump, he's focused on 
China, he considers and he said it clearly, uh, the EU as an enemy as even worse than China in his own word. And so we are afraid that the United States might withdraw uh, from Europe. To me, that's not the issue. Uh, that's not the issue. The issue to me is that the risk is that the United States increasingly sees Europeans as, um, and I quote uh, someone close to, to Trump, as instrumental partners um, in the global competition with China. Um, in French, we would say l'Europe instrumentale, which is not a very nice concept. We don't like being used or perceived as an instrument. But uh, that's, that's the way we are, are perceived, uh, as a sort of a chessboard, if I can say, uh, a playground uh, for foreign uh, powers, in particular uh, uh, China uh, and the United States, and to a lesser extent, uh, uh, Russia. And that puts us in a very uneasy uh, position. We saw that with the Huawei, uh, issue with a huge pressure coming from the United States and the equivalent pressure coming from China. Do we need to choose between both? And you know, European officials say we cannot choose between the United States and China. But what is our strategy? I mean, that's a very big, uh, a big issue. And behind that, there is this American idea uh, that because uh, the U.S. now is focused on the big issue, which is China. We Europeans need to carry more of the burden of crisis management in the South, in Africa, in the Middle East. The US are fed up, they don't understand the region, they want to get out, to reduce their military footprint, and so Europeans need to step up. And this is where France in particular, because of our military engagement in the Sahel uh, and, and our cooperation uh, in terms of counterterrorism with the United States is, is strong, makes France, I would say, a special partner uh, for, uh, for Washington. And I also believe that this allows, to a certain extent, President Macron uh, to, to, be, to have maybe a more direct language with Trump, because this is something, an element in the relationship with Washington that makes France a credible hard power partner uh, with uh, the United States, especially since the UK uh, is, is now reducing uh, its military footprint uh, as well. Which leads me uh, to uh, the future uh, of the transatlantic uh, relationship. No, that's for the end. Um, if there's one thing positive that Trump has triggered, is that he has forced, forced us to reassess uh, the transatlantic relationship. Uh, in French, we say, remettre à plat, the transatlantic relationship. Um, Trump has profoundly changed the debate on five major issues, and I'm not sure that we will actually return to the status quo ante if he ever doesn't get uh, re-elected in 2020. The one is the debate about sovereignty. Um, it's amazing how sovereignty has become a concept that everyone is, is now using to defend its interests. Uh, you know, uh, Trump said it's about US sovereignty, and uh, you have the mirror effect in Europe, especially driven by France, la souveraineté européenne, European sovereignty, how to protect European values and interests, especially from uh, the extraterritoriality of uh, US uh, uh, economic uh, and financial uh, power. And this has become a quite normal debate to have. But to what extent are we really able to implement this sovereignty at a European level is, 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 is new. Um, and, and challenging, but it forces us to think also in terms of how to protect trade, technological, military uh, sovereignty. The other debate that Trump has profoundly changed is the NATO debate. When you go to Washington, you go to the Congress, you meet with congressmen, Democrats, Republicans, it's amazing how the NATO debate has been 
uh, Trumpized or Trump trumped. Um, there is now a general agreement that has always been the case, but even stronger, uh, that Europeans really need to step up and spend much more in terms of the protection of the European uh, security. Uh, and I think Europeans un understand that. Um, you know, we are a bit uneasy to say that Trump has accelerated the increase in defense spending, but he has. Of course, uh, Ukraine in 2014 has accelerated that trend, but, you know, the Trump factor is, is, is also working quite, quite well. The, the third major issue uh, that, that Trump has changed is China. And I was showing uh, this, um, this, this, uh, this cartoon, which I think is really representative of, of what's happening. And Macron, you know, saying, uh, l'ère de la naïveté est terminée, uh, that the era of naïveté is over, and that we also need to step up and to take a, a, a more robust uh, approach vis-à-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis China. And I just added, really, are we <laughs> really not naive anymore? Uh, I think this is also part of a, a discussion we, we should have. Uh, the fourth major or the fifth uh, major um, issue um, for which Trump has really changed profoundly the debate, especially in the United States, is trade. When you listen to the Democrat candidates to the presidential uh, election, there's not one candidate that actually runs on the pro-trade agenda. Not one, because being pro-trade today is a, a dirty word uh, in the United States. Um, even in Europe, I mean, in France, the idea of, uh, you know, and that's something that Trump is pressuring Europeans to do, to sign a new trade deal, free trade deal uh, with Europeans is something that doesn't resonate at all and was not resonating under the Obama administration, but even less today, because we have become much more protective of our norms, uh, and uh, especially in France, of uh, our, our agriculture. And so we're stuck in that, uh, in that debate. And the fifth and last major <coughs> issue where Trump had a, an impact is multilateralism. In fact, he is a disruptor of multilateralism. He hates multilateral alliances, especially the traditional classic alliances, NATO, UN. What he likes is a direct bilateral conversation, ideally with a complicated, nasty dictator. And he, he loves the, the photo, the picture impact of it. So we understand that. But he has also accelerated a rethinking of multilateralism and a, and a rethinking of one big question is how to adjust the 25th century multilateral institutions that we built together, Europeans and Americans, after the Second World War, how to adjust them to the 21st century challenges. Uh, because we cannot work, cooperate the same way we used to do, used to do uh, as we used to do a few years ago and uh, and today. And in fact, multilateralism is becoming less and less Western. Um, if we could um, be a little provocative, uh, mm -hmm. I, I would say that uh, what we are witnessing this last year, also because of less US investment um, in, in this organization, is a sort of de-Westernization of the patterns of international cooperation. China, Russia are now meeting, you know, with uh, other countries in different formats of, of cooperation and proposing a different vision, an alternative to the so-called Western vision of international cooperation. And the G7 is an example of that, where, uh, you know, the G7 uh, in, in Biarritz uh, had a few impact on, on a few issues, but seeing these leaders together uh, and the weight uh, these countries represent in terms of demographics, in terms of economics, it makes you wonder, are these formats still representative of today's 21st century uh, balance of power? And, and Macron has tried to subtly uh, you know, take that into consideration by inviting other leaders of other countries uh, to participate to a few meetings. 
But there is a, a, a deep rethinking of that to, to, to be taken. The UN Security Council, here represented on, on the table, is, is paralyzed. NATO need to be rebalanced and the WTO <coughs> need to be reformed. And that's interesting <coughs> because both Europeans and Americans actually share uh, that perspective. Then you have the disruptive US approach and you have a more, I would say, uh, a negotiating compromise approach on the European uh, uh, side. But this is typically an agenda where as transatlantic allies, we should be working more uh, together. And uh, I'm, I'm little by little approaching the, the conclusion. I mentioned the sort of de-westernization of international cooperation. What I think is really interesting and the theme of this lecture is transatlantic relationship, but that put the you know, Chinese uh, uh, flag. I think we cannot uh, discuss, think of the transatlantic relationship uh, in uh, isolation. Um, I think we need to think of the transatlantic alliance as an alliance among many other alliances. <coughs> and on many issues, important issues, be it Iran, Syria, uh, the reform of multilateral organizations, climate, we cannot manage these issues as a transatlantic issue. We have to cooperate, partner with other powers, including powers that don't always share our values or our strategic objectives. Um, in the Middle East, China, Russia, Turkey are as important or even more important today than the United States and even more important than us Europeans who have difficulties you know, um, uh, designing a Korean policy. North Korea, you cannot manage North Korea uh, between Trump uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, the North Korean leader. China, South Korea, Japan, all of these countries are actually involved. And so what I'm trying to say is that we are uh, and I think that explains a lot of the difficulties we're having as academics, as politicians, of understanding these trends that are accelerating and changing um, our perception of, uh, of power politics, global politics, is that we are entering a new era of geo-economics slash politics, uh, where Western powers, because of their domestic issues, and I think all of the countries are concerned by that, will be more inward looking and non-Western powers, I don't like this concept, but uh, I don't have an alternative, will become more interventionist and willing to increasingly sh be shapers of that emerging international order. And so how do you combine the old world, the post uh, Second World War, multilateral architecture and these powers that are increasingly uh, having an important geopolitical, geoeconomic footprint, how do you manage that without falling into the Trump trap, which is believing that you can contain China today and that you can uh, hamper China uh, from uh, becoming uh, an even greater power than it is today? I mean, that uh, to me seems to be quite, quite absurd. I'm trying to discuss and dialogue with China on trade, technological innovation, trying to find a way to, to cooperate, yes, but to be in such an offensive approach is something that uh, is, um, is slightly problematic. I'll conclude because I'm very eager to discuss with you on the final thought. Um, before getting into the impeachment thing. Uh, <laughs> when you think of the, the future of transatlantic relationship, and that's really the message I wanted to send, um, I think the strength of the transatlantic relationship will depend less on the United States and more on us Europeans. And what Europeans can do more together with the United States and without the United States. <laughs> Together, that means how to formulate, design, and implement a more coherent vision um, uh, to tackle the 21st century challenges, how to reinvest uh, the strategic debate, how to rethink the European security architecture 
to really reinvest uh, the arms control uh, debate, where it's just beginning to actually think about it. With the United States, of course, we're going to continue to cooperate with the United States. The United States will continue to be our closest, uh, our closest uh, ally. Uh, and for France in particular, in the counterterrorism field, it's absolutely essential to have that relationship. And finally, without the United States, well, there are going to be increasing the number of issues where we will have to actually formulate, design policies without the United States. And that's not just only because of Trump. It's because of the longer trends I've been discussing at the beginning on climate, on trade, on Iran, and other issues. So to conclude, I will say you know, the United States remains a critical power, a close ally, but will become increasingly less reliable. And this um, understanding of reliability is something that is very profoundly felt in the French um, uh, political military circles, actually, this question was not triggered by Trump. That's why we are quite at ease to a certain extent in cooperating with Trump and his administration. To us, the question of can we still count on our American ally was actually triggered under Obama in 2014 when he you know, declared the red line in Syria and didn't follow through. And President Hollande at that time was, as you all remember, alone, saying, okay, so what are we doing? And, and can we still count on our American ally? And I think that's an issue that is troubling all of us Europeans. Can we still count on our American ally? To a certain extent, we're asking the same question vis-a-vis -vis the British. Can we still trust our British ally? Um, and I'll close uh, with... Um, you might have read his article, Steve Vaults, Harvard professor, a brilliant piece, which I really invite you to reread in today's context. He published a piece in the Survival Journal in 1997 called Why Alliances Endure or Collapse. And he was saying there are three uh, important dimensions that make that 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 makes us understand why alliances endure collapse. The first is the change of threat perceptions. The second is what he called declining credibility. When a member of an alliance believes that being part of this alliance is not useful anymore. And the last one, domestic politics. And that's the, the item that he really emphasized back in 1997 where he was saying it's less maybe about the external threats changing because we will be able to adapt as allies. There will be different degrees of urgency, but we will adapt. But it's really about domestic politics. How is this going to affect the way governments will project uh, a vision, uh, will act on the international scene? Uh, and what is happening uh, today with the uh, uh, this uh, impeachment uh, and the way <laughs> Trump is actually not handling at all well uh, this, uh, this process is going to have a very direct impact uh, on U.S. Uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, and you're already seeing the beginning of that. Um, so domestic politics matters and there is no purely external, no purely domestic politics issues anymore, they're completely intertwined. And so this is something that scholars also need to take into account to be much more attentive to the politics, uh, the societal trends in these different countries, uh, so that maybe next time uh, we might be less surprised <laughs> by, by certain, uh, certain events. So thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions or comments, and I'll just sit down here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Please raise your hands. If you want to 
have a question and please be as short as possible. Do you want to answer every uh, Let's say two or three. That would be better if it's possible. Thank you very much. Uh, I will ask you to go beyond Trump and ask you what would be the consequence if Trump is not to be elected. Mm. Thank you. Short and precise. Mm -hmm. Uh, the United States promoted multilateralism when they were clearly the most powerful nation after World War II in absolute and relative terms. Now they have lost out in relative terms and now they want to go it alone. Why is that? Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> Uh, you sketch, uh, sketch what is called a surprise-free future, basically a continuation of trends. Now, things can get out of hand very, very rapidly in <coughs> strategic fields. One is, of course, the trade war, and we have to third this as an example you know, of an accelerated trend with terrible consequences, and rapid diminution of so the world trends and the uh, uh, escalating economic differences. So this one, the second thing is of all the question of disarmament arms, but if you can't see you also, we're in a situation unprecedented since the height of the Cold War, where uh, the, all the major treaties are running out, uh, new, new players are the new weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, it, mistakes may, might happen very very easily, I think, in Cuba we had a close miss, but we cannot be sure that in the future mm. uh, the miss will happen, uh, and, and uh, especially in Europe, we say yeah. intermediate forces uh, treaty having uh, come to terms, and, uh, and yeah. basically Europe, I don't know, we cannot count upon, uh, upon the French uh, deterrence, and uh, so I think it's yeah. a very dangerous situation. So, and I think in, in both cases, there was things not there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We take this three together. Yeah. I think the mic is still on, no? Yeah? Uh, so, um, beyond Trump and the consequences uh, of not um, being re-elected, um, well, in fact, I would uh, support the idea that, um, of course, there will be a change of uh, of tone. I think you can hear me now. Yes. Oh yeah, really? Okay. Okay, I'll take the mic then. Um, there will be a change of, of tone, obviously. Uh, but when you look at uh, who is uh, in front uh, competing with Trump on the Democrat side, uh, things are not going very very well. I mean, uh, uh, Joe Biden. I mean, this whole Ukraine. Uh, affair is affecting him and is going to affect him a lot. Um, Bernie Sanders uh, has suspended his campaign because he is sick. And so who is left? Elizabeth Warren, who's a superb candidate, very energetic, has great ideas on many issues, but she's very on the left. Um, and this might, uh, you know, for a certain amount of Democrat electors, uh, be considered as two on the left. Um, and Biden was, you know, among these Democratic uh, candidates, the only centrist uh, candidate. So he was a sort of compromise and an easy, easy option. But if Trump doesn't get reelected, there, there's a change of tone, that's for sure. But things will not go back to normal. Uh, I think that we have to forget the idea that in the transatlantic relationship, uh, we will be best friends again. Were we ever best friends? Uh, uh, you know, uh, I remember an advisor of uh, Trump saying uh, one year ago, you know, uh, Trump is, uh, uh, if we could, um, you know, put one sentence of what Trump is doing, he's ending the era of American hypocrisy. Um, Americans and Europeans, yes, are allies, they have cooperated on many issues, but maybe we have been hypocrite allies and maybe that uh, it's time that we clarify 
are divergences today. And in fact, Trump has succeeded to do so. But no back to normal on the international scene, as I said, on trade, on China, on burden sharing. Many of these issues are actually 100% shared by Democrats. And that's why, I don't know if you observed that, uh, for the moment, we have no clear idea what Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, or even Joe Biden uh, think in terms of foreign policy, because they don't really have an alternative discourse to, uh, to, to, to show. Um, so on many of these issues, Trump has trumped many of the debates that I, I described then on, I would say, the much tougher issues uh, you know, regarding American uh, society, um, I think that, um, you know, there are things that will be very difficult to repair. Uh, I think your question, if I could re reformulate, is what is um, reversible and what is irreversible? And I think that's a good way of, uh, you know, dividing your sheet and putting the items that you think will be reversible and the things that will remain. And there are many, you know, concerning issues that, that might uh, remain. I mean, uh, the American society has never been that much uh, divided. Uh, we were just discussing before this conference that uh, Trump mentioned uh, the risk of a civil war uh, because of the impeachment and that the American people will be so divided that uh, there might be a risk of civil war. So these are, you know, terms that are very strong, uh, but we saw 